boards where all of the boards cross each other and underneath are dried specimens of plants from somewhere around the world. The text is by Florence Thenard and photographs by Yannick Fourier. We'll read the back. Imagine sweating in the desert alongside Theodore Monod, or walking the Chilean coast with Darwin, or getting lost in the Amazonian forest in the company of Humboldt. Follow in the footsteps of Marco Polo on his journey to Asia, and browse the Pacific like Bougainville. Welcome to Adventures in Botany. From ancient Egypt to the present day, Explorer's Botanical Notebook reveals portraits of the greatest travelers and their expeditions around the globe. Also on display are exceptional reproductions of their original botanical specimens. Through these documents, both precious and moving, jump into the footsteps of the greatest botanical explorers and share their taste for adventure. In the previous video, I covered the introduction of this book that was printed in 2016. And we read about the author, Florence Thenard. This time we'll cover a little bit of the contributions. The Royal Botanic Gardens Q is one of the world's greatest botanical gardens. Over one and a half million people a year visit its famous glass houses, historic buildings, and beautiful displays of plants from around the globe. As well as being an extraordinary garden, Q is a world-leading scientific organization with extensive living collections, a herbarium, research laboratories, library, museum, art galleries, and the Millennium Seed Bank, which holds over 2 billion seeds in safe storage. Q Gardens adorns the south bank of the River Thames in West London, the gardens were designed by some of Britain's most famous landscape architects and date back to 1759. Today, the 320-acre site is of huge historical importance in terms of architecture, botany, and landscape design. In 2003, UNESCO declared the Royal Botanic Gardens Q a World Heritage Site. Q's research is wide-ranging, encompassing plant diversity, conservation, and sustainable development around the world. The herbarium was founded in 1853 and was originally formed from several private collections of dried plant specimens, including that of Q's first director, Sir William Oker. The collection includes specimens from some of the world's most celebrated scientists and intrepid explorers including Charles Darwin, David Livingstone, Richard Spruce, Ernest Wilson, and Joseph Hooker, to name just a few. There are currently 8 million dried plant and fungal specimens held here, 350,000 of which are type of specimens. The specimen by which the name of a plant is defined. The collections continue to grow, with around 37,000 new specimens added each year through active research programs around the world and exchanges with partner institutions. The collections, which are arranged according to the latest DNA research, are used every day for the study of systematics, micromorphology, biochemistry, and molecular genetics, a 
as well as being the basis of many of Kew's conservation programs. New species of plants are named here almost every day. The correct identification of plant species is the foundation of all understanding of the plant world. Specimens are also constantly being digitized so that they can be shared with the world online. The library, art, and archives collection is also vast and unsurpassed. In total, it holds more than seven and a half million items, including books, art, and illustrations, photographs, letters, manuscripts, periodicals, and maps. The library is one of the most important botanical reference libraries in the world. Q cares for more than 200,000 prints and drawings, with many original works of art from the masters of botanical illustration including G.D. Arrett, P.J. Riddell, the Power Brothers, and W.H. Fitch, as well as celebrated contemporary artists such as Christabel King, Pandora Sellers, and Rachel Petter-Smith. The art collection is regularly shown in exhibitions in the Shirley Sherwood Gallery of Botanical Art. Special collections include the works of Mary Ann North, which are housed in the gallery named after her in the gardens and letters written by Charles Darwin just before and during his famous Beagle voyage. The library collection dates from 1852 through items in the collection. Though items in the collection date from 1380 right up to the latest research papers, which are available to everyone. Scientists and horticulturists alike use the specimens, artifacts, and plant knowledge that have been collected at Kew to further the understanding of plants and fungi, to aid their conservation and protect the Earth's environment for the benefit of all. You can access many of Kew's collections online. Please go to www.kew.org where you can learn much more about Q's work in the gardens. And that's Christina Harrison, the editor for Q Magazine. And so we see several of the scientists from the Q Gardens here in this picture. I think we took a look at before, but we have Lydia White, John Harris, and David Goiter of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And you can see they're leaning and sitting on giant specimen cabinets that they pull the drawers out to find things that are kept inside. In partnership with the University de Montpellier too. Without fear of contradiction, we can say that any herbarium exists because of the explorers. It grows and continues growing thanks to harvests, exchanges, and observations by men and women from all times and places. They have explored backyard gardens, local streets, mountains on the horizon, the end of the world, and the four corners of the earth. The material they brought back remains an incomparable scientific tool, a database and a resource to be explored. Concentrated in a very small space in a large world, a herbarium. Some names are more familiar to us than others. Some are associated with exotic locales and infinitely rich continents. From the 17th century to the present, some of those who enriched the collection in the Montpelier herbarium include Tournefort, Chagomont, the Lille, and Monod. Others were explorers of the wide world, circumnavigating the globe in the 18th and 19th centuries. Comerson, Bougainville, and Dumont d'Herville were among them. By bringing back specimens of flora and fauna from previously unknown regions, they furthered our discovery and understanding of the planet. New uses were discovered, whether ornamental carded plants or the economic development of new materials. By putting these samples into the collection, they built up a scientific heritage we still depend on today. But they were not the only explorers. Many people have explored the environment close
closest to them. They are not as well known, perhaps, but they are just as fundamental to the understanding of life, and they have contributed to discovering and naming the elements in their local heritage. In Montpellier, the great figures include Ghost and his impressive herbarium and Candol and Dunal, whose research on Mediterranean fungi is still being used by mycologists. And there were many who patiently, passionately, and anonymously added specimens to the herbarium. This work continues today, still adding specimens to tomorrow's herbarium. Collections are being enriched as new specimens are mounted and notes patiently inscribed on labels, recording a precious image of the world at a particular moment in a particular place. There is a final type of explorer, more discreet perhaps, but no less important for the understanding of our heritage. The passionate amateurs and researchers who work every day to use and enhance the value of this preciously conserved information. Using modern techniques, the essence of the information in digital images and labels is becoming accessible to the entire world giving the collection a new dimension. By bringing the MPU herbarium to life and enabling it to remain an exceptional heritage resource, and by making it known worldwide, they are explorers of yet another world, the world of herbaria. And that's, I don't know if it's Michel or Michael Robert, President, University de Montpellier. And here we have a couple of scientists, Veronique Borgod and Pierre Schaefer, uh, from the Scientific Heritage Center, working with some of the specimens. Now, last time we covered three. Christopher Columbus, sailing west to the spices of Sabango. Christopher Columbus, conqueror of the Atlantic. Christopher Columbus was born in 1451 in Genoa, and like many Genovese, found his life's work on the sea. He worked on sailing ships on the Mediterranean, and then between Portugal, England, Iceland, and Madeira. He settled on Madeira and traded a great deal with the Canary Islands and Azores. In 1484, he was proposing to reach the east by going west. The King of Portugal refused to finance his voyages, but Isabella of Castile financed four of them. The first two, 1492-93 and 1493-96, took Columbus to the Caribbean Islands. On the 3rd, 1498-1500, he reached Venezuela, but thought it was an island. His fourth voyage, 1502-1504, ended with a shipwreck and a year of being stranded in Jamaica. Wealthy but weak and out of favor, Columbus died in Valladolid at 55 in 1506. So here we can see his beginning starting point in Europe, sailing across to San Salvador on this first voyage. Is the earth round? Yes, was the answer given by many European scholars and sailors as early as 1480. Christopher Columbus was one of them, an experienced merchant and an outstanding navigator. He had studied Marco Polo's Book of the Marvels of the World, and made many notes in his copy, as well as the Catalan maps of the coasts of India, China, and Japan, known then as Sibango. Based on faulty calculations, 
since Columbus convinced himself that the spices and riches of Asia were within reach of the brave sailor who took an Atlantic route. The king of Portugal rejected his idea in 1484, so Columbus offered it to Queen Isabella of Castile. At first she was not interested, but she was eventually convinced by the idea of profit. She paid for two caravels, a carrack, meaning a four-masted ship, and a crew of ninety ruffians and adventurers. On August 3, 1492, the flotilla left the port of Pelos de Mongor, headed west. The crossing was difficult and uncertain to the mysterious rim of the Occidental world. Rations ran short, and the dead calm seas frightened the crew. But at last, on the morning of October 12th, Columbus set foot on the island he named San Salvador, then continued to the coasts of Cuba and Hispaniola. The first expedition was one of conquest. Columbus wrote brief, technical descriptions of the land, but his amazement showed through. On the island named Juana, I also saw seven or eight kinds of palm trees, whose majesty and beauty, and that of all the other trees, plants, and fruit, easily surpass our own. He noted in his log as he sailed along the coast of Cuba. On that first trip, he brought back some plants, including peppers, which he so named because he was sure he had landed on the Indian islands beyond the Ganges. The goals of his second voyage from 1493 to 1496 were trade and colonization. Two doctors traveled with him to answer the two essential questions. Where are the spices, and what will the colonists eat? They found corn, a kind of millet that comes to a point, and is nearly the thickness of one's upper arm, and yucca that the, quote, Indians used to make bread. They recognized aloes, lemons, cherry plums, and turpentine trees, but could not hide their disappointment. The cinnamon was not as good as that found in Spain. The tiny dates were only good for feeding pigs, and Columbus brought back a little gold, some slaves, pineapples, and tobacco. The results were poor compared to expectations. Despite two other expeditions, the Admiral of the Ocean Sea died before he reached the American continent and never knew its immensity or its wealth. And here we have a map from 1758 of the island of Hispaniola. So they have it split in two here. Atlantic Ocean, the North Sea. <laughs> I think they have that a little bit wrong. I promise our invincible rulers, who have given me some help, that I will give them as much gold as they require, as much spice as they desire, along with cotton and gum, and aloe wood, and as many slaves as they request. And that is a quote of Christopher Columbus. Off by 1,000, Columbus estimated that China would be about where Florida is. He was relying on a correct estimate of the Earth's circumference made in ancient times, but his error lay in his interpretation of the figures used by the Arab scholars who had translated Greek and Latin texts using a mile of 6,473 feet, or 1,973 meters, and not the Roman mile of 4,862 feet, or 1,482 meters. Transatlantic sugar cane. As a trader, Christopher Columbus regularly purchased cane sugar from the Portuguese at Madeira. In 1493, he introduced roots of Sacrum officinarium to Hispaniola from 
somewhere it spread to Sao Tome, Cuba, Jamaica, Brazil, and Mexico. And here we have a specimen of the tobacco plant, Nicotinia tobaccum. This tobacco specimen was collected in Santiago de Las Vegas, Cuba in 1907. When Columbus landed in the Bahamas in 1492, the Arawak natives offered dried tobacco leaves to the explorer. Not understanding their use, he threw them away, and it was not until a month later that his officers discovered some villagers inhaling the smoke using a hollow Y-shaped stick called tobacco or tobacco. And so then we here we have a dried halved specimen of a tobacco leaf and plant. We have the flowering portion here and the large leaf underneath economic plants of the world distributed by C.F. Baker. Number two, Nicotania tobaccum variety macrophylla song collected March 1st, 1907 at Santiago de Las Vegas, Cuba by C.F. Baker illustrating the effect of growth under cheesecloth. From these plants, the finest wrapper tobacco is taken. They become five to eight feet or even more in height and the leaves, though not greater in number, become very much larger, thinner, and finer, and are at much greater distances on the stems. And then we have the cursive written out of the Nicotania, conquering a new world of botany, Oviedo in the Americas. Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo e Valdez was born in Madrid in 1478. His education by the Duke of Aragon was filled with Renaissance humanism. At 13, he was made a page to Prince Juan, who was the same age, and they became friends. Thus, Oviedo was a witness to great events at an early age, and he began to write about them. For instance, the siege of Granada in 1492, and Columbus's return from his first voyage. When the prince died at 19, Oviedo sought consolation in travel. He worked briefly as a secretary for the Inquisition, but at 36 left for America as a gold inspector and historian. He did not return permanently to Europe until 1556, and died at Valladolid, Spain, age 75. So here's his voyage, leaving Europe and heading over to South America, and then up to Cuba. What mortal intelligence could comprehend such an infinite multitude of trees? Those that cultivate and those that nature produces without the aid of human hands. So many plants that are useful to man, and so many others that are unknown to us, and how many roses and flowers and fragrances. Fascinated but not at all daunted by the immensity of the new world, Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo e Valdez, known to us as Oviedo, threw himself into an immense project. His general and natural history of the Indies, islands, and mainland of the ocean sea. Although he was the official historian of the Catholic monarch Isabella, his research and writing conditions were not comfortable. In 1514, the Spanish were still struggling to settle on the Caribbean islands and the coast of the American continent. Oviedo arrived as the inspector of the Castile gold mines in a region that covered modern Nicaragua and Costa Rica. He sailed with the armada of the conquistador Maria de Avila, who commanded 20 ships and 2,000 battle-hardened men, eager for wealth. Gold excited their greed and that of private 
volunteers who attacked the mines. In addition, Avila turned out to be violent. He tyrannized the Spanish as much as the Indians. In 1520, Oviedo had to escape secretly in order to tell the king. He returned in 1524 with a mission to establish order in the province of Cartagena, where the conquistadors were destroying each other. After another voyage to Europe, he returned as the governor of the city of Santo Domingo, a frequent target for Caribbean pirates. Despite that, Oviedo continued his gigantic botanical harvest and started rigorously classifying all the plants. His task was all the more difficult because, faced with such absolute novelty, he lacked the words to describe the America's bounty. He frequently had to use native names or make comparisons to European species. There is a plant called Ahes, which to my eye looks a little like a turnip from Spain. He was the first to attempt description of dozens of plants including potatoes, banana trees, pineapple, lignum vitae, barberry fig trees, which he called a monster tree, and serious Repandus, or Peruvian apple cactus. He noted the Indians' useful inventions, such as the hammock and canoe, but found fault with others. One of the bad habits of the Indians is to inhale the smoke they call tobacco. I do not understand what pleasure they get from it. That was only one of the insoluble mysteries of this unknown continent, so different from Europe. Little did he know how important tobacco would become. The Indians eat human flesh and are abominable and cruel sodomites. They shoot arrows poisoned with herbs so that the wounded only survive by a miracle or die while eating their own flesh or the soil. That was Fernandez. <laughs> Fernandez de Oviedo, the quote. I'm guessing he didn't think highly of the natives, huh? Drawing of a pineapple by Fernandez de Oviedo y Valdez from his history, Historia, General and Natural de las Indias, 1851. Revolution. Following in Oviedo's footsteps, Francisco Hernandez, the physician to Philip II, led the first European scientific expedition to the in seven years in Mexico. From 1570 to 1577, he described 2,500 species, a botanical revolution for the European continent that only knew 600. Transatlantic imports and exports. Oviedo was also interested in the trees brought by the colonists. Orange, apple, pomegranate, date and olive trees and grapevines, they all flourished better in the soil of the Americas than in Spain. So here we have Ananas sativa. This specimen of the Ananas species was harvested at Trinidad, Cuba by W.E. Broadway in 1928. Christopher Columbus had been seen the pineapple in Guadalupe, so in the he by the unique fruit. Oviedo described its shape, taste, fragrance, consistency, and medicinal uses in great detail. We have what appears to be a leaf. It's been nicely folded up, taped down so it doesn't flop around. Another part with the flower top and the stalk over here. And again, the long, pointed leaves. Flora of Trinidad. Anamar Sabria Lindell. Collector W.E. Broadway. 16th of the third month, 1925. <laughs> that cost everything. 
Magellan in the Malaccas, now the Maluku Islands. His route starts at San Laura de Parameda, and he goes towards South America, Rio de Janeiro, Rio de la Plata, around the Strait of Magellan, the Pacuba Islands, San Pablo Islands, Marianas Islands, Balwan, Brunei, Timor, around the Cape of Good Hope, and back up to Europe. Around the world. Ferdinand Magellan was born around 1480 into an old noble family of northern Portugal. At 24, he joined the fleet to the sail to the East Indies on behalf of King Manuel I. Between 1505 and 1513, he was in every battle and fought to take Malacca alongside his friend Francisco Sorreo. When Sorreo went to settle in the Malaccas around 1511, Magellan became involved in a military campaign in Morocco. Since Magellan's reputation had suffered because of some lapses in discipline, Manuel I rejected his idea of a new route to the Malaccas. Magellan sought help from Charles V and began his expedition in 1519. He did not reach the Malaccas, nor did he sail around the world, because he died in the Philippines in April 1521. On August 10, 1519, the flagship Trinidad with the San Antonio Santiago Concepcion and Victoria set sail from the port of Seville with 256 crewmen. Their leader was a young Portuguese officer, Ferdinand Magellan. Only 39, he had succeeded in convincing the young king of Spain, Charles V, to finance a risky venture, sailing around South America to reach the Malaccas. These islands, the source of cloves, belonged to the Portuguese, but Magellan planned to correct the maps of the Indies and give possession to Spain. The expedition began well, but soon fell victim to bad luck and mortal dangers. As vividly recorded by the knight Antonio Picafetta, the fleet spent its first winter in Patagonia, but in that icy desert, three captains mutinied that would not be a fun place to winter over. The rebellion was quelled, but the Santiago was shipwrecked. Then exploration of the strait that now bears Magellan's name went on for a month. As it was labyrinth, surrounded by high snow-covered mountains. At Easter 1520, the desperate crew of the San Antonio took over the ship and deserted. When the surviving sailors finally reached the vast Pacific Ocean, they cried tears of joy, but then faced three months and twenty days without fresh food. We ate biscuit, which was no longer biscuit, but powder of biscuits swarming with worms. Yuck! It stank strongly of the urine of rats, recounted Pigafetta. The water was putrid and stinking, plagued by scurvy. They survived by eating leather pieces of the sails. Finally, they reached the Marianas Islands and ate their fill of coconut bread and palm wine. That would be horrible. The worms, not the wine. When Magellan landed in the Philippines, he required the islanders to recognize the rule of the king of Spain and pay him tribute in the form of gold, pepper, cloves, cinnamon, and nutmeg. One chief named Silapulapu preferred to fight and killed Magellan with his lance on the beach on Macton Island on April 27, 1521. Magellan never saw the Malacas, but his surviving ships got there in November. Their persistence was rewarded with large cargoes of cloves, obtained at ridiculously low prices. But the Concepcion had to be scuttled because there was not enough crewmen, and the whole of the 
Trinidad was coming apart. Although the Victoria was leaking in many places, she miraculously rounded the Cape of Good Hope. On September 8, 1522, the 18 weakened survivors reached the Andalusian coast. Selling the cloves barely covered the expedition's costs. Henceforth, humans knew the limits of their world. Wow, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Map of the Strait of Magellan by Jodocus Hondius, 1606. These old maps are so neat. Very incorrect for the most part, but pretty neat. So here you can see just this bit of passage between all the mountain ranges, you know, showing the mountains on all sides. Interesting. Cheap cloves. In the Malaccas, Magellan's companions traded for their cargo of cloves with red cloth, matches, glass cups, and ribbons and even obtained 100 pounds for two bronze chains, worth 10 sous in France. Living Leaves Picafetta observed some very strange trees which produce leaves which are alive when they fall and walk. I kept one of them for nine days in a box. When I opened the box, that leaf went round and round it. It was probably a leaf insect of the Philidae family. Oh, how amazing. Leaf insects. That's very cool. Syscisium aromaticum, formerly known as Eugenia carlophyllata. The specimen of cloves was harvested in the Malaccas. So here you have the stems and the leaves. And then the bits they collect the clothes off of the flowering parts. Another specimen. Sent away abruptly with the words, 
Wassail, Wassail, meaning well, well. As soon as he had delivered his message, he was given truce of six months to take Solomon's reply, wrapped up in cloth of gold and sealed to Vienna. The ambassador hastened across the Balkans and returned with a mandate to negotiate a peace treaty with the Turks. He then spent six difficult years in Constantinople, more or less confined to his residence and subject to many frustrations. The pacifist Busbeck admired the love shown by the Turks for flowers, which they cultivated with the greatest care, and bought bulbs from the Janissaries who guarded his door. Among these bulbs were tulips, which originate in Central Asia on the slopes of the Himalayas. They had become familiar in Constantinople around 1000 BCE and bloomed in the gardens of Topkapi Palace, illuminated like jewels by lantern light. The Turks liked their tulips tall and thin with sharp pointed petals and lyrical names like Rose of Colored Glass, Light of the Mind, or those that burn the heart. The gardeners created more varieties, and tulips were everywhere at the height of the Ottoman Empire, embroidered on clothes, engraved in stone, and painted on tiles and pottery. The bulbs Bespec sent across the Bosporus arrived in Holland, and ended up in the hands of Carlos Clusius, a famous Flemish botanist. He hurried to acclimatize them in his garden in Leiden. They were highly coveted, and one night his garden was robbed and his bulbs stolen. Sounds like my squirrels. That was the beginning of tulip mania that gripped Holland and spread throughout Europe. Tulips, especially those with multicolored petals, were worth at least as much as gold. In 1635, a single bulb of Semper Augustus was sold for 13,000 florins, the price of a house with garden and stables on Amsterdam's most beautiful canal. That makes sense if they came from the Himalayas, why your tulip bulbs have to have a good hard winter in order to bloom. Here's an engraving of Tulipa bonanensis and Tulipa pomilus from the book Cordus Floridus, first edition of 1614. The engravings were the work of Crispin van de Pass the Younger. Beautifully sketched rendition of a tulip. Stamens. And here's a little butterfly or moth. And then another type of tulip here. A little bit smaller. We saw meadows of the most beautiful variegated colors. The paths were bordered by narcissus, hyacinths, and tulips, and a thousand Turks stood there offering us bouquets all the way. Busbeck. The Turban Confusion. The Turkish word for tulip is lael, but Busbeck speaks only of tulip the Turks often wore tulips attached to their turbans, so it's possible that Busbeck asked his interpreter what that was, but got an answer referring not to the flower, but to the headwear tulip band. Ah, oh, there you go. So now they're named tulips. The alchemical virus. The capricious tulip bulb may suddenly produce feathery petals, striped in red and white. This mystery was worth its weight in gold and was unsolved until the 1920s, when it was found that a virus was responsible for these sought-after anomalies. How interesting. So our specimens are Tulipa alpina, Tulipa montana, and Tulipa chesneriana. These specimens of various species of tulip were harvested in 1834 and 1856. Our gardens also owe a debt of thanks to Busbeck for the common lilac and horse chestnut. So here we have the bulbs of the different tulips and then some have the flowers attached. And this view of the leaves. 
book.